I'd like to welcome everyone and say uh, good evening, good morning, and assalamu alaikum to everyone who's attending with us today while we host Dr. Mark Fabian. This uh, series of human development webinars uh, was inspired by our empirical research on uh, well being of Muslim youth, Muslim educators and university students, faculty, and parents in one of the studies. Because our uh, empirical study included some of the constructs that are research and important for well-being, but they're also important for um, socio-emotional development, psychosocial factors of development, education, and growth. So that's why we have been focusing these webinars on some of the topics that are relevant not as competencies and uh, well-being components only, but also some of them are values that are important for our Muslim societies and others. So we had people who talked about, presented their research on forgiveness. We had some people who presented on uh, empathy and others on uh, compassion. And um, you know many of those topics that are very important and we have been seeing emphasis lately more and more on these uh, types of uh, competencies, skills, values related to global well-being of the human being. So I want to welcome you uh, here. I would like to also thank Dr. Mark for joining us. Um, Dr. Mark is a senior lecturer and deputy director at the Institute for Social Change in the University of Tasmania. He is very well accomplished and he has an affiliation at the Bennett Institute for Public Policy in Cambridge University, where he also was a postdoc. He was previously Fulbright Scholar at the Brookings Institute here in Washington, DC. He studies well-being from an interdisciplinary perspective with focus on public policy. And it's a, it's a very good fit for us in terms of looking at after we talked about the research of these constructs and concepts and competencies, how can we really take it to the public policy arena? And Dr. Uh, Fabian's experiences and research and his record would uh, help us understand that. He has published extensively on what well being is, how to measure it, and how to build public policy awareness around it. His first book on these themes. A Theory of Subjective Well-Being is forthcoming with Oxford University Press in June 2022. Congratulations on that, Mark. And then his current research explores how well-being policy can be co-produced with stakeholders, communities, and the implications of that for policy evaluation, system thinking, and democracy. So we want to welcome Dr. Mark Fabian again. And while you present, I would like to ask everyone to um, field their questions in the chat or the Q&A. And once Dr. Fabian finishes his uh, presentation, we will open the floor for a Q&A. I will field the question to our guest and please use the chat to ask whatever questions come to mind related to this topic as we go through the presentation. Thank you so much and Dr. Fabian, all yours. Okay, hey, great. Thanks very much. Thanks for a very generous introduction. I will uh, share my screen because I'm an academic, so I always have slides for these sorts of things. I uh, hope everyone can see my slides. Let me know if there's a problem. Um, so I'm going to try to give a uh, fairly general overview of um, a lot of the philosophical and some psychological theories of well-being that kind of preponderate among academics and then talk a little bit about how they manifest in public policy. I would say that well-being public policy is in many ways uh, quite young. It's, it's sort of not a very well-developed field yet. Uh, I think it has a lot of very hard problems and I don't think we've done a particularly good job of solving those problems yet, but that's understandable. So I'll talk somewhat about the things that we've tried so far, which I think are all very kind of noble efforts um, but maybe not the best things that we could be doing. And I'll talk a little bit about some new ideas that are emerging that maybe have a bit more potential to take things further. Um, 
I don't know anything about Islam really, so I haven't uh, tailored the conversation in that direction, but I'm really interested to hear those kind of perspectives in the, the Q&A. All right, I'll get into it. Okay, so uh, this is the rough outline of the talk. So I'll talk about some of these major theories of well-being and how they manifest in public policy efforts at the moment. Talk a little bit about the what it means to do responsible policy making when you're working with value laden concepts. So well-being is a normative term. It involves a value judgment. Um, and then that raises various sort of political considerations about how you can work with that term. Talk a fair bit about co-production, which I think is a really uh, hot thing in policy at the moment in general, and something that's very well suited to well-being public policy. And then I'll talk a little bit about the prospect of bottom up well-being policy making rather than the current trend towards top-down approaches. Um, but mostly we'll just be talking about point one here. Okay, so in uh, the philosophical tradition about well-being, well-being is defined as what is intrinsically good for someone, so not instrumentally good. Like you might say that uh, being in a pleasant mental state is intrinsically good for you, and if you are healthy, that helps you get into pleasant mental states. And then the health would be instrumental, but the mental state would be what is intrinsically well-being. Some theories would say that the health itself is intrinsic to well-being. So anyway, that's the broad definition. What makes a life go well? And then within that, there are three major schools of thought. So you have the desire fulfillment idea that well-being consists in having your desires met. Objective list theories, uh, which basically list off a bunch of things that are all good for your well-being. And there's kind of sub-traditions of each of these. So within desire fulfillment, there's also a value fulfillment theory. Within objective lists, there's the capabilities theory, which is very prominent in the human development space. There's Aristotelian accounts that are very prominent, prominent in theological theories of well-being. Uh, and there's nature fulfillment accounts. Um, that are particularly common, I guess, in some schools of psychology. And then the third big uh, school of thought within philosophy is that well-being is some kind of mental state, that your mind needs to be a particular way. The most famous case here is hedonism, but nowadays we talk a lot about life satisfaction. So I'll go through all of these in a little bit of detail, uh, and I'll provide some um, analysis of how they are used in public policy. All right, so let's start with desire fulfillment. Okay, now, there's a very common uh, misconception, I guess I'd say, that economists only care about GDP and they only care about income. So I did my PhD in economics, so I'm always keen to defend economics. So it's not the case. What is in fact the case is that economists care about preference satisfaction. So they think that what is good for you is having your preferences satisfied. And income is quite a good proxy for preference satisfaction. The more income you have, the more of your preferences you can satisfy, so you must be better off. It's definitely a simplification. I think that most economists would admit that it's a simplification, but there are some really quite senior and influential economists like Jason Furman in the United States who still really think that all we need to do to improve well-being is to keep GDP going. Um, I'm kind of more part of this movement to go beyond GDP, but I think we're in that transition and we shouldn't forget about GDP and we shouldn't forget about income. They're very important. Now, as part of this notion that preference satisfaction is good for well-being, this is both a behavioural claim, so it's that humans act to satisfy their preferences, and a welfare claim, which is that if humans are so motivated and evolved to behave this way, then there must be some reason why satisfying their preferences is good for their well-being. All right. Now, economists know that people's preferences are often not aligned with their well-being. Uh, people can have really dumb preferences. So, for example, slot machines are very commonly used by a lot of people, even though you are certainly likely to lose money on the slot machines, but people still do it anyway. So people can be irrational in this sense. So economists tend to say that preference satisfaction only counts for your well-being under certain conditions. The ones that are most common in, in uh, economic philosophy are that they have to be fully informed, so you have to know all the relevant facts, perfectly rational, so you have to be able to think through those facts in a sensible way, and then they have to be refined through repeated choice. So typically things that you only do once in your life, like decide what degree you want to do at university, you don't really have a lot of opportunities to learn about 
how life would have been if you'd made a different decision. And so in those cases, we're a bit sceptical about people's preferences definitely being uh, related to their welfare. Whereas if you do something very frequently, like buy coffee at the supermarket, then you can expect that after six months of trying different varieties of coffee, you will settle on the one that you like. And from then on, we can assume that you purchasing that coffee is the thing that you want and improves your well-being. Now, these three criteria, as you may have seen already, are quite idealistic. Um, and we're starting to work more, myself especially, on more kind of psychologically realistic accounts um, of good preferences or choice-worthy preferences. But this work is in the very early stages. In the meantime, I think it's worth emphasizing that part of the reason why economists use preferences is because it's practical, so we can observe people's choices objectively, and they're also liberal. So if we say that all we're trying to do is help people do the things that they themselves want to do, then it's a kind of check on government overreach and paternalism and a lot of other things that the liberal tradition is generally concerned about in political theory. So this is a kind of a safe theory that's uh, useful if you're doing policy analysis and you don't want to do anything risky. Okay, why do economists fixate on income? So I think it's worth talking about this a little bit because it's such a big part of public policy, especially in the United States. So when we want to make well-being comparisons, so we want to compare the well-being of one person to another person, or we want to test how one person's well-being evolves over time or how it's affected by some policy, then it's really useful to have a measure of well-being that is cardinal. What cardinal means is that it's proportional in some way, not just ordinal, which is that it's ranked. So imagine a society with just three people. So you've got persons A, B, and C. Person A has 10 income, person B has five, and person C has one. Now, in an ordinal situation, we say that person A has more income than person B, who has more income than person C. If we've got a cardinal measure, then we can say that A has twice as much as B, because 10 is twice five, and 10 times as much as C. So if we have a cardinal measure of something, it allows us to consider distributional issues in potentially quite a fine-grained way. And because with economics and policy, we are often considering how things are distributed, not just how much of something there is or how much more someone has than someone else, it's quite important for us to have these sort of cardinal measures, and income is wonderful in this regard. The second reason why we use income is because it's really helpful to have a unidimensional thing on which to make those comparisons, and this will be a big theme of the talk. So let me try to illustrate this just with an example to try to get it to make sense. So imagine two people, very simple case. You have individual A, individual B. Individual A has an income of $150,000, 12 years of education and a bad knee. Individual B only has an income of $75,000, but they have 20 years of education and good health. The question then is, who has more well-being, ceteris paribus? So all other things being equal, which of these people do we think has more well-being? And the preference satisfaction account would just say, well, it's whichever one of these lives you prefer. So we've got to make this trade-off. If we try to compare across the three dimensions, income, health, and education, then we have to make some kind of value judgment about how valuable is health relative to education, relative to income, and vice versa. And this is really quite a difficult philosophical puzzle. So what economics tries to do instead is to approximate the value of the education here and the value of the knee by looking at the market price of those things. So what is the market value of eight extra years of education, what is the market value of knee surgery? And that will give you some sense for the dollar value of those things. Now, for goods that are traded in competitive markets, those markets provide a, an, an assessment of the average value of that thing to people because those markets are uh, aggregating preference information. So market data allows us to make a comparison in dollar terms between these two people rather than in these multidimensional terms, okay? Now, often things aren't traded in markets and then we have a lot of problems and there's a huge literature in, in economics about how to value non-market goods. Sometimes it's pretty effective. Other times we have a, a lot of challenges with it. All right. What are some ways that this preference satisfaction account manifests in public policy? Well, basically all economic policy analysis 
is implicitly employing this preference satisfaction approach to well-being. The two really prominent sort of methods by which this comes through in public policy is cost-benefit analysis. So you have a question for policy like, should we build a whole new light rail network or should we just expand the existing bus network? We want to be able to think about all the different benefits that might accrue to all the different people who use these different um, services and then make a comparison of those benefits to the costs of building these things. Now, the costs are in dollar terms, but the benefits are not. So one of the first things we need to do is try to find a way to denominate all those benefits in dollar terms. Then we can get a cost-benefit ratio. And the thing that has a better cost-benefit ratio and a better net present value is the thing that we might decide to go and produce. The second way that it manifests is what's called social welfare functions. So this is a mathematical way of expressing a particular distribution or a particular aggregation of well-being. And this is also quite important for policy analysis. So I've just got two simple examples here. One is the utilitarian social welfare function. That's the first one over here. Let me just get a, a laser pointer. So this one here, so social welfare is just adding up the well-being of every individual in society. This one doesn't really care about distribution. So if, if you N here is the pharaoh of ancient Egypt and they have all the utility in society and these other people are slaves, utilitarianism doesn't really care. It's all about maximizing that social welfare. Or we might think of the Rawlsian maximin function. This is another example. So you want to maximize the utility of the worst off person in your society. So that's a very extreme distributional proposal where it's all about bringing up the people on the bottom. And in between these two, we have all sorts of different ways of doing distributional analysis. So with these kind of tools, we can do a lot of policy analysis and produce a lot of interesting inputs into public debate. It's very difficult to do these kind of things with other kinds of wellbeing theories and other wellbeing policy tools. All right, speaking of other wellbeing policy tools, what about the objective list theories? So we'll talk about those next. So the basic idea in an objective list theory is that there are multiple goods that are all intrinsically good for someone. So it's not just preference satisfaction. Instead, it's things like knowledge, virtue, reason, income, health, happiness. These are all good for people. They all make life go well for someone. Now, this list is derived in various ways, but one of the most common starting points for developing one of these lists is to refer to human nature in some way. So in the Aristotelian tradition, and then from there in the Thomistic tradition in Catholicism, there's a strong emphasis on what sort of creature a human is and what God's intention was for us to do with our lives. And then they try to make reference to that to think about what things are good for us. Um, in Martha Nussbaum's work in Capabilities, there's a strong emphasis on universal human values and deriving well-being theories from those values. And then psychologists have recently proposed that humans have three basic psychological needs for autonomy, relatedness, and competence, uh, and that comes out of our organismic basis. So we have evolved to have those needs, um, and that's, again, a nature fulfillment account of, of where this objective list comes from. I think it's worth emphasizing that a lot of the accounts in philosophy in this space are currently under major assault from empirical reality. So, for example, the idea in Aristotelianism that humans are moral and rational, that these are our kind of unique features and so our well-being depends on these things, I think this is on very shaky ground now. So we are finding that a lot of animals, even an animal as simple as a bee, um, is able to make uh, optimizing decisions over quite complex problems. And this suggests that bees are quite rational in a sense. Um, we've also learned from a lot of the recent moral cognition work in psychology, um, particularly the evolutionary psychology of moral cognition, that humans uh, make moral judgments and then rationalize those judgments afterwards. Um, and that we are in fact uh, generally relying on socialization for our moral views. And that this is a tool that we have evolved to help us cooperate in groups um, and it's uh, not so much the key that we are virtuous, but rather that we are enmeshed in our tribes. Okay, now the most famous, I guess, or perhaps not most famous, but the objective list theory that is most prominent in well-being public policy is the capabilities paradigm, which, as I mentioned earlier, is very prominent in the human development space. So I thought I'd spend a little bit of time on it. So I guess the origins of this theory would be in the work of Amartya Sen, 
who won the Nobel Prize in economics. The starting point for this argument is that income, as traditionally used by economists to measure well-being, is a very poor indicator of preference satisfaction, according to Sen, because your freedom, your ability to satisfy your preferences, depends on a lot more than income. So an example that's often used is Sultan Qaboos of Amman. So he was obviously very powerful as the Sultan. He was very wealthy, um, but he was also homosexual, and the prevailing norms of his state did not allow him to practice that openly, despite his wealth and power. So his preference satisfaction was stymied in that way. He didn't have enough uh, political enfranchisement or cultural enfranchisement. So Sen argued that well-being comes from functionings, which is the particular beings and doings that you go about in your life, or the particular life you lead, and the extent to which you value that life. And then the functionings from which you can choose are determined by your capabilities. So your capabilities are things like mobility. So if you're not mobile, you have a much more limited number of lives from which to choose. Your purchasing power. So if you don't have a lot of income, you can't buy a nice steak. You have to settle for rice. Uh, voting power, rights, education, health, these kind of things. Okay. Now, the most prominent uh, application, I guess, of the capabilities paradigm in policy is the Sustainable Development Goals, and there is a bunch of others. So the Human Development Index was first. That used income, health, and education. Health and education were measured in terms of life expectancy and years of schooling. In the Millennium Development Goals, they added other things, but particularly a lot of stuff to do with political enfranchisement. The Sustainable Development Goals, we then also folded in a bunch of environmental things that we thought mattered to people's capabilities. Capabilities also underpins most of the high-profile or well-known well-being frameworks. So, for example, New Zealand has a living standards framework. You may have heard of the, the well-being budget in New Zealand. That's founded on this notion of capabilities. Bhutan's Gross National Happiness Index actually has not very much to do with happiness at all and is mostly based on capabilities. It was designed in partnership with Sabina Alkira at Oxford, who was a Marcia Sen's student and is very much in the capabilities tradition. And the OECD's Better Life Index is also almost entirely capabilities plus life satisfaction. Okay, this is the ACT government's, uh, the Australian Capital Territory, I should say, wellbeing framework, just to give you a sense for the kind of variables that are included in these ideas. So in a sense, these are all capabilities. Your housing, your environment and climate, what your social connections are like, education, time use, etc. All right. Let's turn now to mental state theories, which I think are kind of on the rise at the moment, mostly through subjective well-being. So the most famous mental state theory, but also probably the least popular, certainly among philosophers, is hedonism, which is the idea that what is good for you is pleasure, specifically pleasure in the brain, so the psychological sense of pleasure. The most famous critique of this is Nosey's experience machine, where he says, well, imagine a machine that you can plug into and you just feel pleasure all the time. Would you plug in? And he argues that most people wouldn't. And indeed, experimentally, we find that maybe 80% of people would not. Um, and that suggests that there is something else to well-being than just pleasure. Um, this was quite eloquently explored in the movie The Matrix, um, where most people don't plug into the fake world of The Matrix. But of course, there was this character Cypher for whom the real world was so horrible and boring and dull um, and life-threatening that he actually asked to be plugged back into the matrix. So there is a, a sense in which pleasure does matter. Okay, I would say that hedonism is basically not used in public policy, except in a few very limited ways. So I've just pulled up one example. This is uh, graphs of different mood states under COVID. Um, and I think this sort of work where mood states um, and various emotional states are used as kind of indicator variables for sort of how society is going to kind of take the pulse of society um, is becoming more common. Certainly, it's common in some areas of policy. So in mental health policy, for example, we use mental states a lot, understandably, but as a broad approach to what is a good life and what's the government's job and this kind of stuff, hedonism is not a not a popular account. There are a bunch of other psychological accounts, self-determination theory, mindfulness, meaning in life, all sorts of other things that I could talk about. Very little use of these in policy to date, except in education, where they're starting to get used a lot more. I'm trying to change this. I think these have a lot of policy potential, um, but because they're not really used yet, I decided not to talk about them 
in this uh, presentation, but I'm happy to afterwards. All right, let's turn then to life satisfactionism, which is, uh, I think, one of the most kind of prominent and uh, vibrant areas of, of policy discussion in the well-being space at the moment. So this is kind of part of subjective well-being. So subjective well-being, according to hedonic psychologists, is a combination of uh, judgments about your life. So one of these being how satisfied are you with your life? How worthwhile do you feel your life is? And experiences of life, which are mostly those mood states that I showed you before. Now, there's a lot of discussion of this empirically. So we measure it a lot and we talk about what comes out in the measures but there's not a lot of discussion of it philosophically. And what I mean by that is there's not a lot of justification for life satisfaction ethically to say that life satisfaction is what is good for someone. That hasn't really been done. Um, in fact, there was a critique by Michael Plant at Oxford in, in 2020 where he argues that it does, there's not really a good foundation for life satisfaction as an ethical um, argument. The one paper or the one book rather that makes a very sustained and I think quite compelling case for life satisfactionism is this book by um, Lawrence Sumner, I think. No, I've probably got his name wrong. Anyway, Sumner in 1996, um, he argued that life satisfaction constitutes well-being if and only if your life satisfaction judgments are relevant. So they're focused on the prudential aspects of your life, not on random stuff that's going on that they're sincere, so they're uninfluenced by social desirability bias and other things, oppression, uh, being afraid that your partner is listening to you while you talk about your life satisfaction, this kind of stuff, and considered, so they're not based on passing feelings but on your, your really kind of well-thought-out judgments. Um, I'm doing some work at the moment interviewing people um, to see whether these criteria hold. Um, at, as I understand it, no person working in life satisfaction has done that work yet. Um, to see whether these criteria hold, even though people in this space do occasionally reference Sumner in support of life satisfaction. In any case, that's a bit by the by. One thing that does get raised a lot in this space when I, I um, mentioned to advocates of life satisfaction that there hasn't really been a lot of ethical argument done on behalf of this view is that, well, how couldn't life satisfaction be good for well-being? Like, um, how, how is this possibly a bad thing? Um, and I think it's worth raising a few, few points here. So this comes back to the very old and, and much traveled distinction between objective well-being, so things that are good for you regardless of your opinion of them, and subjective well-being, which is your own view of your life. So why wouldn't that subjective view be the correct one? So one is to ask a few questions. So like, what if you're blind or you have some other major physical impairment, but nonetheless, you're quite happy or satisfied with your life? Would you say that this person is well? What if you had adapted to your oppressive circumstances and thus you're satisfied with your life within those circumstances? Would you say that this person is well or do we think that they're only well once we've gotten them out of those oppressive circumstances? So this was, in fact, Sen's argument for capabilities in the first place and he thought we definitely shouldn't use happiness as a measure of well-being. So it's this empirical phenomenon of so-called miserable millionaires who report life satisfaction of six or seven out of 10, and happy peasants who report life satisfaction of eight or nine out of 10. Now, this would seem to lead to perverse distributional consequences. So if the purposes of policy is to maximize life satisfaction, then we'd be putting a lot of policy resources into these millionaires instead of the peasants, and that seems kind of wrongheaded. And another problem that I think is quite significant is that if we're trying to focus on life satisfaction judgments it's often going to be cheaper to help people feel better than to actually deal with the source of those feelings. So if I'm experiencing anxiety over climate change or housing insecurity or something like that, it's often going to be cheaper for the government to give me some cognitive behavioural therapy than it is for them to provide me secure housing or deal with climate change. And I think this really kind of lets government off the hook, potentially. But I should say that a lot of these arguments can also be flipped and applied to objective versions of well-being. So, okay, say you're very well off, but you're experiencing ennui. So this is a kind of existential boredom. You just don't really know what to do with your life and so you're kind of dissatisfied with it. Or maybe you're experiencing nihilism. So you're like, well, why nothing matters, this kind of thing. It's quite a prominent theme in American popular culture at the moment in shows like Rick and Morty or Everything Everywhere All at Once, which is uh, blowing up in the cinemas at the moment. 
Another example is, well, what if you're quite well off, but the culture of your rich country just really doesn't suit you? So I'm thinking here in particular of people like Lucas Glass um, or um, Katada. And so these are some white Germans who are quite well off in Germany, um, but just really didn't like the sort of lack of normative structure in Germany to the extent that they left and they joined ISIS because they liked the extent to which ISIS provided a clear and coherent ethical framework for their life. Okay, how does this manifest in public policy, this life satisfaction is in view? So I think this is really kind of in the ascendancy at the moment. It's becoming more and more prominent, more and more popular. Um, this is a recent book by two colleagues of mine at the LSE, a handbook for well-being public policymaking, which is really um, all about applying life satisfaction to policy analysis, policy comparisons, that sort of thing. So they talk about using cost-effectiveness analysis with life satisfaction instead of income, about doing impact evaluations like randomized control trials to look at life satisfaction as an outcome variable, and then looking at cost effectiveness of different policies to improve life satisfaction. And they talk about prioritizing the policies with the highest marginal impact on life satisfaction. Now, I would, I would say, and I've spoken to my friends here about this before, that the first chapter of this book on the philosophical foundations of this approach is really quite bad. The rest of the book, which is about the technical aspects of doing all these things, is excellent, totally world class. Um, so if you're interested in that sort of stuff, uh, I would just go to chapter two. All right. Some technical things that I think are worth raising in this space. Uh, as I said at the beginning of the talk, um, I think uh, basically everything in well-being is really hard. We're not doing anything particularly well. So I don't want to say this as kind of a critique of life satisfaction only these similar problems apply to other methods but i think it's worth just uh pointing these out because life satisfaction advocates tend to be a bit uh i don't know they tend not to talk about these things as frankly as i would like so there is some evidence uh quite a lot of evidence i would say to suggest that life satisfaction scales are difficult to analyze statistically so they may not be interpreted by respondents as linear i'll explain what that means in a second Scale responses may not be interpersonally comparable in a straightforward way. So person A's life satisfaction scale may mean something quite different to person B's. They may not be intertemporally comparable. So when I say eight out of 10 today and eight out of 10 three years ago, those eight out of 10s might mean quite different things. Often in response to these kind of critiques, advocates of life satisfaction respond that they have psychometric validity which means, for example, that life satisfaction went down during the COVID pandemic, it goes up with income, things like that. I don't deny that validity, but that doesn't tell you how precise these things are. And for a lot of policy analysis, we need quite a lot of precision. If you're interested in these issues, I have a paper on this that you can look at. There's also a really good conference um, organized by myself and some colleagues at uh, Oxford last year that you can find if you search um, Subjective Wellbeing Measurement Workshop, University of Oxford Wellbeing Research Center, on YouTube, there's a whole bunch of talks. I hope they're interesting. As I said, capabilities and income approaches also have big issues. We talked about some of them already. So really the counterfactual is bad. The income-based approach is no good. The capabilities approach has issues. So everything's kind of bad. I don't, I don't want to suggest that it's all roses somewhere else. Um, a little short illustration of what I mean about this life satisfaction stuff. I could illustrate this in various ways, but I think this is the easiest one to wrap your head around. So we have here someone's life satisfaction over time indicated by the black line. This is their life satis their latent life satisfaction, so how they feel. They then need to map that into a scale response. So they're asked, what's your life satisfaction on a scale from 1 to 10? And they might do that mapping in a different way on different occasions. So those red lines here represent the scales that they use at each of these five waves of a survey. And you can see that at the start, they're seven out of 10 in their latent life satisfaction, and that's what they give on the scale. And then their life satisfaction gets a bit better, and they say they're eight out of 10. But now by the third wave, they're even better. They were 10 out of 10 on their original scale. So what they thought at this time was sort of possible for them as the best possible life, they've achieved it. Amazing. Wow. Oh, my God. So good. But now, actually, having achieved that, they think, well, life could still be better. I can actually see ways that it could be better and I could see myself getting there. So I don't want to say I'm 10 out of 10 because I'm not completely satisfied. This isn't my best possible life. So they just say 8 out of 10 again. Instead of changing their answer, what they change is their scale. So the scale is changing from now on. 
A researcher who observes this will just see 888. They won't think there's any change in this person's life satisfaction. Actually, they're getting better every time. So this is quite a problem if the only question we ask is the life satisfaction scale and we don't ask something like, are you more satisfied than you were last year or something like that. Okay. Some other uses of life satisfaction scales in policy that I think are really quite um, beneficial and uncontroversial is to use subjective well-being as a leading indicator. So Carol Graham in her work um, looking at life satisfaction across America really predicted the Trump vote way ahead of everyone else because you could see all the dissatisfaction that was fueling his popularity. I think life satisfaction is used in high-level well-being frameworks and it's probably worth throwing in there as just another indicator. Uh, and then it's also used to make international comparisons, but I don't think this is very helpful, and I'll tell you why in a second. Okay. Some problems with generally all of these approaches to life satisfaction. I would say that current approaches are broadly not informative. So the high-level wellbeing frameworks, like that ACT flower that I showed you, are massively correlated with GDP and explained differences are explained by migration. High-level indicators don't point to reform priorities, they lack contextual nuance, and they're imprecise when used in evaluation, sorry, and life satisfaction measures are quite imprecise and they're not diagnostic. The other problem with these measures is that they're not legitimate. So in a policy context, we don't just think about what is scientifically valid, we think about what is politically valid. And this approach to date has been very top-down, very technocratic, very led by scientists. And it has this deficit model of citizens where citizens are riddled with cognitive biases and they can't think for themselves. The scientist has to do it. And I think this is quite antipathic to democratic norms uh, and not really appropriate. So I'm going to talk about each of these points in a bit more detail through the rest of this talk, um, and then I'll finish up. Sorry. I'm not sure how I'm going for time. So Ilan, if I get close to 40 minutes, please uh, let me know. All right. Um, so problems with the current approach. So the first thing I have here is on the left-hand axis, the y-axis, you have the sustainable development goals. On the x-axis, you have log GDP per capita. The correlation here is something like 0.85. It's really tight. Basically, we're just observing GDP in all sorts of different ways. There are some clear outliers like Saudi Arabia and Nigeria, but we can usually figure out pretty quickly why they're an outlier. So in Saudi Arabia's case, it's because of their in a lot of their policies are not compatible with the UN SDGs views on women's rights. These things here in the ACT wellbeing framework are all things the government already does. So I'm not really seeing how this is a kind of paradigm shift in public policy. We're moving away from wellbeing, sorry, from income, from economics, and we're going to do wellbeing instead. But we were already doing all these things. All governments take care of safety. They all take care of health, education environmental quality, access and connectivity. There's public transport pretty much everywhere on the planet. So I'm not really seeing the big change here. Part of it might be that we want a broader suite of indicators, okay? But the indicators that we usually use in these frameworks are too vague to inform policy. I'll talk more about this as we go along. So think about, for example, the health uh, domain. The most common indicator in health domain is life expectancy at birth because every country has this data readily available, it's quite cheap to collect, and we can make international comparisons. But your health is delivered by a health system that's very complicated and needs constant reform. And we have all sorts of very useful, rich, sophisticated ways of analysing health systems. These health indexes don't tell us anything about those reform priorities. Okay. What about life satisfaction? Or life, does life satisfaction tell us more than these well-being indicators? It's very popular right now to do these international comparisons of life satisfaction, like the Global Happiness Report. But I think basically the differences in these scores are GDP. So if you look at the left-hand side, the top 20 countries by happiness, it's basically the world's 20 richest countries. There's a few exceptions in there, like you don't see Saudi Arabia, even though it's very wealthy, you don't see Brunei. Um, and you have a few unexpected ones in there, like maybe Chechia. But broadly, it's just GDP. Now, a lot of people look at this and they say, oh, no, 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 Mark, you've missed something. The Nordic countries are doing better. I don't think this is really that accurate. So if you look at the other countries that are in here, you see countries like New Zealand, Australia, Canada, countries that I would say are liberal democratic rather than social democratic. But all these countries have welfare states. 
And the Nordic countries are much more liberal than a lot of people realize. They have very highly liberalized markets. They went through the same pro-market adjustment in the 80s that Canada, Australia, et cetera, went through. The big outlier is the United States, really. The United States doesn't have as much of a welfare system as other countries. But if you want to look at the reason why these countries come 10 through 20 instead of 1 through 10, you just go across to the right-hand side and look at the number of migrants. So these countries are taking in vastly more migrants than the Nordic countries. Now, the reason why that's really interesting here is because migrants, when they arrive, tend to have lower levels of life satisfaction. So they're dragging down the average life satisfaction in these countries. But having migrated, their life satisfaction tends to improve. So often what's said here is that, oh, well, we should have the Nordic system, more welfare, more social democracy, because it's better for life satisfaction. But we can't do that if we can't have the welfare states of the Nordic systems with a large number of migrants. At the moment in the Nordic states, their politics is in a little bit of turmoil because the migrant populations are perceived to be putting pressure on the welfare system. So you, I think you have a hard trade-off here, and we're not really learning anything from this data about what sort of policies we should prioritise. And I think that if life satisfaction comparisons can't even reveal this kind of level of detail, then we're just not learning a lot from this data. Here's another case study in how uninformative this data is. This is the UK's life satisfaction over the last 10 years or so. You can see that it's broadly gone up, gentle upward slope. This is during Brexit. This is during an incredibly tumultuous period for the government, generally coming out of austerity. It's not really, I mean, Brexit doesn't show up here at all. It's been, I live in the UK. It's been incredibly disruptive, but it hasn't impacted. So if the biggest political event of the last five years in the UK doesn't turn up at all in the life satisfaction data, you've got to start to think this data is just not sensitive enough for the lot of purposes that we want to put it towards. All right. Let's talk a little bit about legitimacy. So as I've mentioned a few times in this talk, well-being is a value-laden concept. It's what philosophers call a thick concept. That means that it both describes, so it's amenable to empirical inquiry, it's amenable to science, but it also evaluates, so it makes value judgments uh, and it licenses normative inferences. So I've said a few times, well-being is what's good for someone. Whenever you hear a word like that, good, bad, evil, this is a value claim. Now, value claims are not scientific things. They are judgments. They are broadly arbitrary unless we subscribe to some kind of theological perspective. Now, in liberal democracies, regardless of what your uh, ethical views are, your ethical philosophies are, we politically tend to think that citizens should be the ones empowered to make the value judgments insofar as such judgments are required for public policy. So how can we do that? How can we bring about this legitimacy? Are these kind of town hall exercises legitimate, if all they do is get the people who are retired in the neighbourhood who have the time to participate, then maybe not. So let's talk about that in a bit of detail. How should we go about legitimate well-being public policy? So this is something that I've been working on a lot with colleagues at Cambridge. We have a paper, um, prominent one paper of a bunch that I'll focus on here. Anna and I, and Alexandrova, we talk about two ways to do this kind of work. You can do it by the letter where you do small consultations, narrow surveys, and other kind of tokenistic activities. So you sort of pretend that you're listening to the people, but actually you, the politician or the scientist, whatever, who the decision maker is, has already decided what they're going to do. They don't really care what the people say. There's no genuine power sharing, and there's no two-way learning. So you're not learning much from the citizens. Maybe they're telling you something, but you're not learning. You're not helping them to learn. There's no deliberation. Or you could do it in spirit. So I think you can do this in terms of large scale consultations, like the Office of National Statistics in the UK talked to something like 35,000 British citizens when it did its wellbeing framework. Or you can do small scale co production. And that's really what we focus on. I'll talk about what that is in a second. So, this is a form of participatory governance and a form of deliberative democracy. Why would you want to do things at small scale? Well, this comes back to my critique earlier about how these high level wellbeing frameworks don't inform policy. Whereas when you go to a specific context and you get a contextualized theory of well-being that is indexed to that area, then you get something that's much more informative. So I mentioned before that life expectancy doesn't tell you anything about how to reform your healthcare system. What about if we wanted to develop a well-being framework just for diabetics? 
So we got a bunch of diabetics together and we said, what does well-being mean to you? Probably they will mention that their health is a big feature of their well-being. And then we said, okay, what does health mean to you? They might say something quite specific. They might say, well, it's really important for me that I have a reliable supply of insulin and that that, that insulin comes to me at a predictable price so that I can budget for it. It'd be even better if the insulin was just like delivered to my house so I didn't have to do anything to get it and I just, it was paid for, right? Now, this does tell you something about policy. So it says that maybe our insulin procurement through the public health system, say, should use very long-term forward contracts so that the price is locked in for multiple years and doesn't fluctuate, doesn't have volatility for the insulin users. So here we have a theory of well-being that's local to particular users that leads to indicators that are directly useful for policy in that area and allows you to have policy objectives that are very informative and detailed. All right, how do you go about this sort of co-production? So I'm, I'm moving quite fast here, but I'll try to give you a flavor. So the key thing we think is to combine three kinds of expertise. So you wanna have the members of the public or the service users. So they're bringing their lived expertise, their value judgments. Then you want to have the service providers, what we call the practitioners. So these are like bureaucrats, nurses, teachers, whoever's delivering the policy. And they're going to bring their professional expertise and their practical experience. So they know how these policies are implemented and they can make sure that whatever you come up with is implementable, straightforward. And then finally, you have your academics or so technical experts. They're bringing knowledge about the particular issue that you're working on, like diabetes, and they're bringing expertise about measurement and statistical validity and these kind of technical issues. Now, if these people genuinely share power with each other, and if there's real two-way learning, so the technical experts come in and they say, okay, like what does well-being mean to you? And they sit and they listen to it. And then they reply to people and help them sharpen their value judgments, help them to think through a lot of complex issues and deliberate on the problems. And the service providers are in there saying, well, that might not quite work because we have to work with these government systems or whatever, but a slight tweak might make it much better. If you combine all these different kinds of expertise, then you can come up with a policy that is legitimate, implementable, and rigorous. And I think this is increasingly common in the Indigenous and development policy space, in the human development space, um, around respecting the right to self-determination. And we're starting to use it more generally in policy, but it hasn't quite taken off in well-being public policy in general. And I think that's a shame, but we're working on it. Now, one thing that's really important here is that you don't want to get too bogged down in qualitative data, but you need qualitative data to inform such a contextualized theory. So in our recent work doing this with an anti-poverty charity, developing a theory of well-being for them, we started with an online survey of their user base. So we got 5,000 responses there. Then we had a small working group of 15 people that did the qualitative work over several months to get a really detailed theory. Then we had a workshop where we shared that theory with another 15 service users and got a view for how they felt about it, saw whether we'd missed anything, and we had missed a few things, but not too much. And then we did a final report, and we took that to a second online survey of another 5,000 users, and they basically said, this is good, where we like where this is going. So we want to combine that representativeness with the uh, detailed data that you get from qualitative information. All right, one thing that always comes up in this space is how would you scale up something like this? Okay, you've got one policy for diabetics, one policy for retirees, one policy for the town of Kuyong, one policy for, I don't know, young people. How are you going to bring this all together into a framework where you can compare the well-being of groups? Definitely work in progress, definitely one of the main weaknesses of this method. But here's what we have in mind. So we've done one well-being framework for people in poverty. We are then going to replicate this with another charity that works on mental health, develop another well-being framework for that context, then another one for drug rehabilitation, another one for housing, and another one for debt relief. And then once we have these five separate well-being frameworks, we will get together representatives from each group to do another co-production at a higher scale, and we will try to find variables that are shared across these five contexts, and then we can do comparisons on those variables. And this will be a slightly higher level framework for the area of multiple complex disadvantage. And then we can do that again, adjacent nodes at that scale, and do it for all of social policy. And we can go up like that. Am I nearly out of time? Yeah. Okay, I've got 
I'll just jump forward to this slide. So let me conclude. So well-being is highly value-laden, and so I think we should be careful about adopting a technocratic approach. We really need to embrace politics. We need to get down with people and talk to them about their values and have these deliberative processes. Everything's flawed, so we shouldn't be afraid of counter-arguments and critiques. We've got to work with those. Measurement and evaluation is especially hard. I think a lot of these high-level frameworks are a bit uninformative and difficult to use, and the bottom-up frameworks hold a lot of potential and we should at least experiment with. All right, thanks very much for your time. I hope I didn't go too much over. Well, that's, that's perfectly okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mark. There's so much here in this uh, presentation that we can go on and on, but I um, use our time with you to ask a few questions from our audience, yeah. as uh, well as a clarifying question that you had in the model you presented that I would like. So sure. maybe I'll, I'll start with that, uh, the clarifying question maybe. Sure. Still the mental health, poverty. Oh uh, yeah. For scaling. To bring it up. Yeah. Okay. So that was. Oops. So, so in, in your talk, the, yeah, in your talk, mm -hmm a lot about governments and citizenship and you know and high level policies i don't mm -hmm. see the governmental sectors or players in your mm -hmm. and is that intentional or you don't see them as players for scaling up well-being you know i work yeah that's doing. a great question so i'd like to do this with government i think this is better suited to government um, but I think governments so far uh, haven't really embarked on this kind of bottom-up approach. And I think it would be difficult for us to convince them to do it if we don't have a proof of concept. So we are working with charities at the moment because they are much more invested in this already to do the proof of concept. My hope is that the Tasmanian government will be interested in doing this kind of work. I'm sort of in dialogues with them at the moment. As I mentioned, this is used in Indigenous policy a fair bit. So in Australia, we have... Uh, I have some colleagues at the Australian National University who've done this sort of work with a range of different Indigenous communities along the West Australian state. And mm -hmm. now they are working at a slightly higher scale to see whether there is a theory of well-being that can apply to all of those Indigenous communities. Thank you. And I'm going to jump to the uh, questions from our um, audience. One question is, probably more broad than what you presented. I think you can bring it and make it relevant to your presentation. How can psychological theories be used in the public policy space? And I think you talked about that a little bit, but maybe you can add to this question. Sure. Um, let me say a few, a few things. So one is there's a conference right now or in the next few weeks in Iceland, the um, Congress of Positive Psychology or something like that, and the, the title of that is Creating the World We Want to Live In. So the whole theme of that conference is applying insights from positive psychology in public policy. And I think there's a lot there. As I mentioned, I think uh, in particular in education, this is being used a lot. So how to prepare people for life not just work so obviously we want numeracy we want literacy but also good for people to have emotion management skills to know how to identify their personal strengths to know how to think about where they want to make sacrifices and how to prepare psychologically for sacrifice these kind of things and i think there's a lot of good psychological work there my general sense is that too much of the well-being policy discourse is about comparing very high level policies like railway lines and this kind of stuff in terms of well-being. And like that's a valuable discourse, but I think we can also take a different approach and just think about, well, like what are some things that government could do that are going to improve psychological aspects of our lives? Um, so reducing stress, for example, um, making people feel happier, this kind of stuff. They can just do that because happiness is nice. Like we don't need uh, anything more complex than that. One thing I would say, though, is I find the psychologists incredibly naive about the political complexities of these things and the ethical issues involved. Uh, I have a paper with a colleague, Jessica Pikett at Birmingham, 
where we try to um, sensitize psychologists to these issues. And that was uh, very well received by the psychologists. So I think that's to their credit. It's published in um, Perspectives on Psychological Science, which is a quite a good journal. So if anyone's interested in that stuff, I'd point them there. Thank you, thank you. I, I like your phrase that psychologists are naive because they don't have the economist head and hat, you know. They look at mm. what they think is um, well-being, happiness, and, and also yeah. like one of the reasons why we're doing our research, empirical research, is to take an asset-based approach to people mm. in the Muslim world, to youth in the Muslim world, so that you're mm. sending a message of empowerment. And so our next question relates a little bit to this. Many of the different measures and indexes of um, uh, well-being uh, fail to address factors like religious, spiritual identity, cultural mm -hmm. meaning-making that, that may affect and even dictate the definition of what life satisfaction is. How do you take that into consideration in your work, especially that you're talking about indigenous uh, groups, populations, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, good question. Uh, I did anticipate this question. <laughs> Let me go back to the ACT one. Um, so you can see the down here, there's the identity and belonging category. So things around whether religion allows you to participate in your society because it is a religious society, for example, tend to come in there. A lot of the high-level thinking on these topics like philosophical works want to leave space for pluralism so you wouldn't want to specify like participating in buddhist culture is what's good for people you just want to say like being able to participate in culture is good for people and then you can index what that means to the particular context whether it's the case that participating in spirituality in particular is good for people's well-being, I think is a little bit more contested, um, but not much. Like, I think most people would concede that, um, but the channel or the domain through which it's usually brought in is through a sense of meaning in life or purpose in life, um, a sense of coherence, so the world sort of makes sense to you in a, in a metaphysical way, um, and a sense of significance that what you are doing um, is worthwhile. Um, and we see this kind of questions used in, in subjective well-being. So it's part of the UK's Office of National Statistics work. Some scholars are unsatisfied with that. They want a stronger emphasis on spirituality. There is a group at Harvard led by Tyler Vanderwill that I think is doing uh, really interesting work trying to have kind of theologically grounded notions of religious well-being and then using uh, questions in the World Values Survey to explore how important that is for people um, and I can I can share links to that work if if people are interested yes we will be very interested indeed so then as next question how does life satisfaction measure deals with enormous threat and insecurity which I think you argued for and security of war zones populations mm -hmm. the life satisfaction of someone in North Syria Palestine occupied territory Afghanistan measure through the same criteria you use for someone from Sweden or Japan or any Western country? I'm sure you yeah. answered this question too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on this one. So, I mean, we do find in the few cases where surveys are done with people in very dire circumstances like that, that their life satisfaction does tend to be very low. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning, and, you know, they have other indicators, very high stress, very high cortisol levels, the high levels of depression, anxiety, all the rest of it. Um, the other thing that makes measurement in that context a little bit difficult is that resilience is quite a tricky thing. So in my work with people in poverty, uh, they're often quite robust people because they've had to become robust as a result of their circumstances. And if they weren't forced to be robust, they would feel even worse in their circumstances. So we wouldn't want to make simple comparisons between them and the life satisfaction of people who are better off. Um, I think it would be interesting to do one of these contextual well-being frameworks for people in those kind of circumstances, but I also think this would be kind of like rude almost. Like if I said to someone in a refugee camp, like, so tell me what it is 
that would improve your well-being, I think they would say, well, like, obviously, I would like to not be stateless. I would like more income. I'd like my children to have a future, this kind of stuff. Um, so I tend to think, to be honest, that well-being public policy of, of this kind of really complex type um, where we're moving beyond sort of more 20th century ways of thinking about development is really a first world problem in a sense. Like it's kind of obvious what you need to work on in developing countries. I taught development economics for a long time. I've lived throughout Southeast Asia. If you talk to people there, they know what they need. They need better schools, better healthcare, access to medicines, better roads, better jobs, all the rest of it. It's really once we are in this kind of, this situation where we have the means to live the kind of life we want to live, but we don't know what sort of life that is. That's that's where I think a lot more of this research needs to focus. Um, but these are quite, I think human development and this kind of well-being are sort of a bit, bit separate. Interesting. It's really basic needs versus well-being in some yeah. right, yeah. But you I know, so. um, uh, this theory which or, or assumption you shared at the beginning where people in poverty including my own parents used to tell us mm -hmm. you, know, you don't have to have a lot of money to be happy you mm -hmm. just be satisfied and and we have a, even a saying in arabic where you just you know spread yourself as big as your bed this is how it goes mm -hmm. so if you're yeah. if you're trying to push yourself out of this bed mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to achieve much you'll break the bed right so just mm -hmm. stand with it and and be happy satisfied and of yeah. course, Allah will give you, God will, will give you. So that's a very common um, approach that I've seen in my own work in the Middle East and other areas. To the extent, sometimes the word resilience, I feel like it's the word we, we invented, and that's mm -hmm. just my impression. We invented this in the Western world to feel better about what's going on with, re with the refugees. We can't help them get money, get, you know, what they need right yeah. away because of all politics and so forth, economics, but we can help them become resilient because it helps yeah. us feel better, I, I think, myself. But anyway, uh, I don't know what you think about that, but I'm agreeing with I'm you. I'm sympathetic, yeah. <laughs> I, I yeah. And, and it's very interesting the way you're approaching this because I'm one of those naive education psychologists, human development mm -hmm. people thought, yeah, we can change lives, even if we yeah, don't. Yeah, I mean, we can. We've just got to be aware of political sensitivities, I think, basically. Yeah. Agree, agree. Okay, one last question, and I think we're running out of time, is um, how, do, how are these indexes that compare life satisfaction, how are these in comparison to life's... Oh, there's the World Peace Index, which is also the word happiness you mentioned, how do they compare to the life satisfaction index that you talked about and measured? I don't know if you're aware of the uh, world peace index or not. I don't think I am, so you'd have to explain it to me. Okay. I didn't ask that question, but... Uh, okay. it's Probably the, the, I mean, life satisfaction is very highly correlated with all the other stuff that's in these indexes, so they tend to move pretty closely together. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I can't think of too many indexes that aren't tightly correlated with income and with life satisfaction. Yeah. Okay, so maybe a last question from me. Should we stop what we're doing in terms of empirical research on well-being and just take it more into the local, the contextual? Or should we continue despite the fact that there are so many things that are not <laughs> right about those kind of measures of we included life satisfaction measures that was used, yeah. you know, uh, globally with high reliability. We included mm -hmm. making, we included in our study. What would you advise people to do from your perspective? Okay, yeah, thanks. Nice question. Um, no, I think uh, my, my basic attitude is like, this is really hard. Um, we, should, we should keep trying. My sense is that it, the status quo Right, this kind of purely economic approach is sort of increasingly played out. It's bad for the planet. It's not really bringing us satisfaction. Um, it's disconnecting our societies. It's not good. So even if it's very like technically sound, 
it doesn't seem to be achieving the things we want to achieve. So if there are other things that are less technically sound but are closer to the goals that we want, then we should explore those things and we should be tolerant of that lack of robustness of these methods and we should just try to improve it. So I think we should keep working on everything. What I would like to see and what I have a paper on is, is a little bit more theory about what well-being is. So less of an emphasis on what can we measure and what's comparable internationally and a bit more emphasis on like what makes a life go well. Um, so I think in that space, there are some more complex or richer psychological theories than just life satisfaction. So I really like the well-being profile, which is a 15 item question. Um, and yeah, I think more broadly than that, I really do believe in this um, contextual approach. So I think this is uh, being increasingly applied in the development space going in with communities, trying to empower them to think about what they want from the world and from life. Um, and then on that basis, thinking about what the donors can do to help and trying to set up more of a collaborative approach. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Thank you. Thank you. And on this positive note, we will end our webinar today. I want to thank you so much, uh, Mark, yes. for your contribution, for your very, very insightful critical and uh, important uh, talk on well-being, uh, especially this whole connection between the research, the theory, but also the public policy arena and what can we do with all the knowledge that we're accumulating and what's working, what's not working. That's, that's huge. Thank you for that. Thank you for your time. Thank you for our audience for being with us. And yeah, thanks for coming. You go. If you don't mind uh, sending me some of your publications on email, like the links you, the articles you've been mentioning, will yeah. be happy to share it. And I uh, thank you for adding your email here. If anyone is interested in continuing the queer conversation, I think they can just um, email you. I hope that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's why I did it. So yeah, if, if your question wasn't answered, just feel free to email me. I'll, I'll do it. Wonderful. And this actually ends our last webinar for before the summer. Please stay tuned for our fall series. Maybe it will be inspired by this talk. We will be in touch and we will let you know. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening, day, night. Assalamu alaikum. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.